and welcome to the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. I'm Count Zero. We've got another major cover game this issue with Nintendo Power issue number 34 for March of 1992. Again, we've got a really big game this issue to cover, so let's get started. Our cover game this issue is Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past. I held, up this, uh, held off on covering this game earlier because I knew this issue was coming. The cover itself is a posed photograph. Now, between the art from back in Fun Club News, the rather clumsily done photograph from way back in issue number four with its mannequin Zelda, and this issue here, my order of preference in terms of Zelda covers, is the Fun Club News art, followed by this one, and then finally issue number four. I think what makes this one work so well over the other photographic cover is the design put into the props. The Link costume in the games at this point is fairly basic. However, We've got a lot of detail put into this, um, the props. We have the, uh, detail on the hilt and grip of the Master Sword, and then there's that shield with the uh, crest of the Kingdom of Hyrule that looks absolutely gorgeous, and which they would have had to have had made because the crest made its debut in this, ga debut in this game. <clears throat> Speaking of Fun Club news, with this issue of Nintendo Power, we get something that we haven't had since the days of the last few issues of Fun Club news. Overt game advertising, as opposed to the slightly more subtle advertising we'd gotten in terms of guides for games they want you to buy. In this issue, we have an ad for the Super Scope and Super Scope 6. In the letters column this issue, we have notes on what incentives people want to renew their subscription for Nintendo Power. The letters that the magazine published ran towards the absurd, absurdly massive shopping sprees or getting the opportunity to play basketball with Scottie Pippen. Instead, I'm going to focus on some of the more artistic endeavors from Nintendo Power readers. We have some parents who decorated their kids' room with a mural inspired by Super Mario Brothers, specifically the water levels. There's also some hot glue figures of Legend of Zelda and Super Mario characters, which, considering this game's cover game, seems apropos. They look pretty good, considering the material. I'm not familiar with the medium of hot glue sculpture, so I don't know how long or how durable the figures are, compared to, say, for example, Pearl or Pixel Art. Starting off with our NES titles, and in the wake of the Star Wars game for the NES a couple of issues ago, we have our next Star Wars game with Empire Strikes Back. Man, with The Force Awakens coming out this month, I couldn't have planned my schedule out better if I tried. Anyway, focusing on the article and the game... The guy takes you through the ice caves of Hoth and fights with a wampa and the Imperial Probe through to the Battle of Hoth and finally the escape of Echo ba escape from Echo Base in the wake of, or rather, in advance of the advancing Imperial troops. The guide also provides notes on the Dagobah training levels and teases the Cloud City levels. Empire Strikes Back is a decent game, and it avoids one of the problems I had with the original game, the presence of falling damage. I actually played this game once before for a quality control column, back when I was doing this series as prose article, so I'm familiar with this game from before. I'd say probably this game's best innovation, one brought on by the plot of the film, is the development of force powers. It can let you jump higher, run faster, and hit harder against enemies. There's also a somewhat improved charge jump, where you can hold down to crouch for a while before jumping, allowing you to jump higher, but not necessarily super dramatically higher. Um... Further, the game lets you shoot in eight directions, like Contra, which is another step in the right direction. This game does have a few problems, though. The first is it handles resource management poorly. Stock enemies will drop health items to help you refill your health, but they won't drop items to refill your force meter. Further, sometimes your high jumps, whether individually or force augmented, aren't high enough for you to get back to the where you fell from or that sort of thing, which means if you take a wrong turn, you can find yourself cut off from significant portions of the level unless you engage in some very prolonged and costly, in terms of force power and health resources, backtracking. Also, I will say, as someone who's not a big fan of ice levels, while I understand the movie starts in Hoth, giving Hoth ice level physics, was, in terms of the sliding, was probably not the best option. Um, having a mix of normal movement, because hey, you're on snow, and then Slippery Ice movement might have worked better, but anyway. Um, the game's not terrible by any means, and I've certainly played worse, and I will play worse this issue. But this is definitely a game where I'm not in any hurry to pick up a copy. Next up is a guide for LJN's second adaptation of Terminator 2 Judgment Day. 
this time for the NES. The guide covers each level in the game and gives a heads up that there is only one continue in this game and that it's an item you can miss. Terminator 2 is a game that has two significant problems. First is the game gives you no continues aside from the aforementioned item and thus once you run out of lives it's game over and you have to start over from the beginning. The second problem is that the second level of the game requires much more rote memorization than the speeder levels from Battletoads and in a much less forgiving fashion, requiring you to memorize your route through the level with no warning of where your, level, where your vehicle needs to be and when. It's very much a pain in the ass, making this game not very fun, and it honestly doesn't represent the film very well at all. Um, in the movie, Arnold basically wades through, like the, for example, the bikers at the, uh, rest, at the uh, truck stop and biker bar, with very little hassle, whereas here, it's a significantly difficult uh, opening level. Um, further, the enemies don't actually drop any power-up items or health refills or anything like that to help make getting through the game more manageable. It feels like a game that is a quarter muncher that was or designed as a quarter muncher that was never an arcade game in the first place. Next up is Nightshade, a superhero adventure game with action elements. We have maps of the first area of the game, as well as the overworld grid map, along with notes on the peril scenes you encounter when you're defeated. Nightshade is basically an adventure game with combat, and really clunky combat too. I've generally found that adventure games work best either with no combat at all, combat that is more turn-based RPG inspired, in terms of Final Fantasy, Dragon Quest, or even Wizardry, or combat that is itself a puzzle, like the insult sword fighting from the Monkey Island games. What makes the combat here this issue is that it's meant to be real-time brawler-based, action-style combat, and it's also kind of a mess. Some of the fights in particular are supposed to be puzzle-ish, but not in the sense of insult sword fighting, but the sense that you have to figure out the right strategy for the enemy, just like other boss fights and other, and other um, well, NES action games. This still doesn't fix the clunky combat, though, as due to how the combat controls work and how healing and regeneration from combat works, no matter how well you try it and how many times you try it, you're still going to get hit, you're still going to take damage, and you're still going to have to deal with that on other screens and other encounters. This leads to the other problem, because health is hard to come by. You can get health by eating food, but this really is the kind of game, due to how it's structured and all the exploration involved, that would, where it would fare better with regenerating health or having you start each combat with full health, so the focus is on surviving each combat instead of health being another resource to manage. This definitely feels like a kind of game I'd prefer, I'd prefer to play with a game genie code, so I could have full health, instead of um, having me focus on surviving the combat and having me focus on um, the crappy combat system, I could focus more on the puzzles. And that aspect of the game, which is what I'm getting in for when it comes to puzzle, ga puzzle games and adventure games. I want to experience the story. I want to experience the puzzles. I want to work on solving those rather than getting crappy, brawly combat, which is just not fun. Next is MC Kids, a action platformer that's also an advertising game for McDonald's. Um, we have maps of the first six levels of the game. And, well... This is a shockingly well-done platformer. I thought we would have one of two possible scenarios with this game. It would be a crappy cash-in license game on par with the LGN titles that we've covered before, LGN and, and uh, Ocean. Or because this game was developed and published by Virgin, a British company, this would be a mediocre port of a PC platformer designed for the Amiga or the Spectrum or a similar system like that. This is actually surprisingly well done, with some interesting level mechanics, particularly related to reversing a character's individual gravity. The controls are also very nicely done as well. The main flaw I see with the game is with the arc of the character's jump. The jump arc is very high, but not very wide, without really a way to get a running start for more distance on the jumps. You can still get some distance, but nothing quite like what you'd get with some of the Mario jumps. And... Mario is kind of the gold standard for platforming jumps at this point. That said, the levels are designed with this jump arc in mind, so it's not really that much of a liability. In the classified information column, we have some secrets for Legend of the Mystical Ninja. 
In this issue's installment of the Legend of Zelda Link to the Past comic, Link discovers a glider that will help him reach the ruins in the middle of the Hyrule Desert in order to get the Pendant of Power. We next, getting into our Game Boy titles, have our second Mega Man title for the Game Boy, Mega Man 2. As with the previous game, this goes through two sets of four Robot Masters. We have a recommended order of Clash Man, Metal Man, Wood Man, and Air Man for the first set, and Needle Man, Magnet Man, Hard Man, and Top Man for the second set. We also have maps for the first quartet of Robot Masters. Unfortunately, Mega Man 2 for the Game Boy has the same problem that Dr. Wily's Revenge had. The developers simply failed to figure out how to adequately manage having very character-filled sprites on screen that were also big enough to give levels and characters the amount of, well, character that we're accustomed to having in a Mega Man game. And the screen real estate available on the Game Boy and having the level design reflect those limitations. So... This led to situations where, for example, the balance just doesn't work. A great example is the moving platforms in the Crash Man stage. In the NES version, you could jump over enemies as they spawn, whenever they do hazards like this where you have moving platforms and enemies that spawn in. If they weren't in a position where you, could, where you couldn't shoot them, or rather where you could not shoot them, you could jump over them, and then when they got in a position where you could shoot them, you could just shoot them. This takes skill to do for the jumping and adjusting your position to shoot at enemies as they approach, but it was certainly possible, allowing you to get to this portion of the stage potentially without being hit. Here, though, the track is too confined, the, cre the screen is too small, and all the sprites are too big, so you can't get through this screen without getting hit at least once. Continuing with our Game Boy titles, we have Tiny Toon Adventures for the Game Boy. We have maps for the first two stages, and notes for the third and fourth stages. My primary complaint with the NES Tiny Toons game was that they couldn't reconcile their physics, which had a slippery, out-of-control feel that fit with the tone of comedy cartoon movement, with the level design for the game. Well, Tiny Toons for the Game Boy doesn't have this problem. The slippery physics are still here, but the game feels more like they designed the levels with those physics in mind. Consequently, we have levels designed with large, fairly detailed sprites, where you have enough advance notice of where you need to go, in terms of camera perspective, to plan your movements without getting too complex when it comes to the jumping required. However, this game introduces a new problem, resource management. You are switching between three characters, Buster Bunny, Hampton the Pig, and Plucky Duck, each with a fruit they can throw as enemies as an attack, in addition to jumping on them. The problem being that you have limited throw ammunition, and each weapon has a different arc. Um, Bucky's, or, uh, Plucky's pineapples rebound off the level geometry, Buster's carrots fly in a straight arc going through level geometry, and Hampton's watermelons roll across the ground like bowling balls. So, different weapons are more useful in different situations. It almost feels like it would have been better to keep the different shot types, and then have them have have a shared ammo pool, because instead the way it works is different boxes or whatever will drop different ammo for different weapons, and hopefully you get the ammo that you need for the attacks that you need to use for the level environments that you're working with. Um, it doesn't work great, but the game is still otherwise fairly enjoyable, uh, and is definitely superior to the last Tiny Toons game. Next is a casino game, which we haven't gotten one of those for a while, in a while. Um, High Stakes, which is the premise that you're an undercover cop trying to bankrupt gangsters through gambling in order to get them behind bars. I guess narratively, this makes it the Roaring Twenties gangster version of Casino Royale. You know, this is a game which had some real potential of all the casino games I've played thus far. So I'm kind of disappointed when the game squanders that potential. This game could have basically been the gambling equivalent of Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. Each gangster has their signature game or preferred game, or several games that they play. You go through different types of card games, and the gangsters have betting, fa betting styles and tells that they do, where by picking up their cues, 
of when they know they're like lic- when they know they're licked and they're showing it, or when they're, for example, betting it really heavily if they know they've got a good hand or whatever, um, then you can know, okay, I should bet less or I should fold early or that sort of thing. Depending on the difficulty of the opponent, these betting strategies could be more complex of the enemies or they could have more transparent tells in their sprite animations. For example, the Glass Joe introductory character could be the guy who goes all in too often in poker and who has very transparent tells for when he's got a great hand or a terrible hand. Unfortunately, this game isn't that. Instead, you go through a series of gambling games where you're not actually competing against the opponent, but against the house or against a machine, typically a slot machine or a video poker machine, which is doubly odd because this is the 1920s, making this a straight game of chance as opposed to having any sort of comp- competitive element and also meaning there's very little skill involved. This sets up my disappointment. I, I wanted a skill-based game, and I just didn't get it. In Super Mario Adventures, while Princess Peach and her troops get ambushed by Lakitu, who'd like it to rain spinies, see what I did there, meanwhile, Mar- Yoshi recruits Mario and Luigi to help the Yoshi clan take down King Koopa. In this issue's Counselor Corner column, we're introduced to the E3 team, meaning Evening Shift Team 3, as opposed to the people covering Nintendo's booth at the Electronic Entertainment Expo, which we don't get our first one of for another three years. Anyway, we have tips for a bunch of RPGs, including Lagoon, Draken, and Dragon Warrior 3. Moving on to Super Nintendo games, we've got Lemmings, a certainly iconic puzzle game and one which puts Cygnosis on the map, allowing them to go on and make games like the Wipeout series. We have notes on the different types of Lemmings you can use to set up the level, and notes for several levels, but not level maps, which is... Something of a bummer, as getting a full screenshot map would be great for getting some idea of how the level designs work, particularly if you're completely unfamiliar with the game. Lemmings is a fun, classic puzzle game, which does the puzzle game with real-time elements properly, but then you pause the game at any time, view the map, and change what type of lemming you have selected, and see where your lemmings are in comparison to everything else on the map. It's perfect, and the only thing that could make this game work better would be if this game had been released after Mario Paint, so the developers could have used the Super Nintendo mouse. Next is the caveman platformer Joe and Mac. We have maps of the game overlapping onto the poster. As good as this game is, and it's alright, I can't help but feel that I would rather Legend of Zelda Link to the Past had gotten the poster space for their maps. This is a simple basic action platformer, which is notable in that this is the first original platformer franchise for the Super Nintendo that we've seen featured in Nintendo Power. Everything else that's come up has been, as far as for sole platformers, just platformers, been things that were adaptations of existing NES franchises, Mario, that that sort of thing. I've had, I had some reservations about this game due to the character designs looking kind of doofy, but it works. The sprites are incredibly expressive, and the controls look, work nicely, and for that matter, the difficulty scales fairly well. I would consider this a forgotten gem for the, for the Super Nintendo. Well, not too forgotten. A quick search shows the game currently going for 15 to 20 bucks on eBay. At long last, we have come to our cover game with The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. We get a rundown of all the items we'll encounter in the light and dark world, along with the overworld map for the light world, which is chopped into chunks with each chunk getting a section. The guide doesn't give you a chronological event walkthrough for for the game, which is probably for the best. We also have a bit of info on the dark world, but no in-depth walkthrough. We may get more on that late in a later issue, but for now, Link to the Past is our cover game, so now is the time where, where I'm going to review it. Link to the Past is, in my opinion the perfect gateway game to the Legend of Zelda series, aside from the first game on the NES. And even then, Link to the Past incorporates a lot of the gameplay elements that have been included in later games in the series in terms of the wider selection of puzzle items, um, and particular traversal items being used for dungeons in ways that they weren't before, like stuff like the hookshot, taking things beyond, for example... 
using the ladder, the raft, and the boomerang and bombs in the dungeons for the original Legend of Zelda. So, if I was to pick a simpler Legend of Zelda game to get someone into, introduced to the franchise and kind of get them prepared for the later 3D games, this is the way to want to go with. In particular, because the 2D camera perspective, like Legend of Zelda, um, kind of confines how the level geometry and level design works. It makes things more approachable and lets the player basically turn the dungeons and for even that matter the overworld map into more manageable chunks that they can handle and process a little better than with the big, wide, expensive overworld. It's something that I kind of picked up from all well, classes I've taken in technical writing in terms of Dividing information into chunks makes them more manageable and makes it easier for people to learn things. When it comes to, for example, tutorializing a player in use of the hookshot for traversing a dungeon or using other traversal items to get through the world map, this is a more manageable way of doing it, I think. Um, and it's certainly not that the levels are without any degree of complexity or dumped down. They do, they do certainly do have complexity. The Super Nintendo in particular allows dungeon rooms to have two planes, an upper and lower plane, um, that Link and enemies can be on, and that you can go back and forth between, which is something you couldn't do on the original Nintendo. But it's still a little bit more elegant in how it does this, and works better for, for example, players drawing out maps of the dungeons or using other things to track their progress and n more easily navigate the dungeons than they would have had for the Nintendo 64 or GameCube Legend of Zelda games. This is, frankly, one of the best titles in the Super Nintendo's library, and I'd certainly consider it in my top five titles for the system, without question. This issue has our ballot for the 1991 Nestor Awards. The Graphics and Sound, Theme and Fun, Challenge, Play, Control, and Best Overall categories have three subcategories based on Nintendo's now three platforms. So I'm going to be giving my picks for each category, pretty much. For Graphics and Sound, I'm going with Ninja Gaiden 3 on the NES, Metroid 2 for the Game Boy, and Super Castlevania 4 for the Super Nintendo. For Theme and Fun, which is also frequently used to include Story, I am going with Star Tropics on the NES, Final Fantasy Adventure on the Game Boy, and Final Fantasy II on the Super Nintendo. For Challenge, I'm going with Ninja Gaiden 3 on the NES, Metroid 2 on the Game Boy, and I'm going to skip the Super Nintendo category, as there are two games on the list that I haven't played yet, Super Ghouls and Ghosts and Super Nintendo SimCity. For Play Control, I'm going with Kabuki Quantum Fighter on the NES, as it had really solid play control, and I think it's an underrated gem. For the Game Boy, I'm going with Metroid 2, for reasons that I've gone into previously, and for the Super Nintendo, I'm going with Super Mario World, as its controls are a big part of the reason why it's so fun. For best multiplayer, my preferred choice of F-Zero, um, with its, four, with its uh, multiplayer modes there, is not available in this category, so I'm going with Tecmo Super Bowl instead. For best villain... I am really torn between Dr. Wily and Bowser. I, I love the Mega Man series, and I think Wily is a character with some... with a lot of character to him, and with a lot of interesting charm uh, as an antagonist villain. And he's, he's not, he, has, he doesn't have any narrative depth, but he has more narrative variety to a certain degree than Bowser, and how, he, how Wily approaches problems to a certain degree. I'm kind of stretching things, but I like I like Wily. Bowser's going to win. I'm going with Wily anyway. For most innovative game, I'm going with Pilot Wings. Um, which presentation of flight simulator gameplay on the Super Nintendo. I do recognize I was not able to get this game to work for a gameplay capture and review, but I think it does some important things when it comes to Mode 7 and the use of it for different gameplay mechanics on the Super Nintendo that other games hadn't before, and hopefully some other games will do in the future. 
For best overall, I'm going to go with Ninja Gaiden 3 on the NES, Metroid 2 on the Game Boy, and Final Fantasy 2 on the Super Nintendo. In Nestor's Adventures, the game being covered is Rampart, particularly the multiplayer. The tip isn't much of a tip, unfortunately, to destroy your opponent's cannons. I can't help but feel that if we had additional page, that maybe a more somewhat involved tip might have been used for the strip this time, but maybe that's just me. In the Now Playing Review column, one of the games featured in this issue, Terminator 2 Judgment Day for the NES, gets panned by the reviewers, which is probably a first for the Now Playing column. I mean, they've panned games before, but not a game that has been featured in this issue. They generally tend to take the stance where if a game is featured in the magazine, it is worth your time. They also don't like Wizardry 2 Knight of Diamonds, but the difference in how they express their dislike is very different. For Terminator 2, they make it clear this is a bad game that does not play well, whereas the dislike of Wizardry 2 is more due to a matter of personal taste, which I appreciate that. In the top 20 column, uh, Mario once again owns the top spot on all three platforms. And it also bears mentioning, with my discussion of the Final Fantasy games in the Nestor Awards uh, ballot, that every Final Fantasy game that has, as of this issue, been released in the United States is on their respective platforms list. Three for the Game Boy, and one each for the Super Nintendo and the NES. In the Celebrity Profile column, we have, a, we have an interview with Corin Nemec, who plays the title character in Parker Lewis Can't Lose. Since his time as Parker Lewis, he has been Jonas Quinn on Stargate SG-1, along with a slew of other TV and directed video film roles. And wrapping things up, in Pack Watch, the Super Nintendo is getting Test Drive 2, and we have a report from Winter CES. The clear pick of the issue is Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past. It is a fantastic installment in the series, and... Frankly, most rankings of Zelda games put it, in, if not the number one slot, then at least the top three up there with Majora's Mask and Ocarina of Time. As a fallback pick, I'm on with Lemmings. The PC version's a little better as it supports the mouse, but it also, but the PC version also doesn't support two-player play as much. If for some reason you can't get a hold of Lemmings, um, or you do prefer the PC version, I want to go that route. I'd go with a recommendation for Joe and Mac. So, thank you very much for watching. Next issue of Nintendo, uh, Nintendo Power Retrospectives will be in two weeks. Um, another big title that that week. Uh, if you enjoy the show, please like, subscribe, and tell your friends about the show. And if you feel like tossing some money my way, please support the show via Patreon. There is a link to the Patreon page up here. If you're on the YouTube channel, if you're watching anywhere else, it is down there in the show notes. Um, or just down there in the show notes anyway. Any money that goes my way will be used to help make the show better. Improve video quality, that sort of thing. And also help me get the show out a little more, show out a little more regularly. And for that matter, if you support above the five, above the five dollar level, you will get to have your name in the credits. There's a few other perks um, that you can get, depending on what financial level you support. All that information is on the Patreon page, so go check that out. So until next time, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you then.